ഫൈക്കിസ് ഇൻഡസ്ട്രീഡ് Good evening, it's now six o'clock. I'm handing over to the CEO of SOMA, Dr. Wilson Wilson Thalpe. Thank you very much, Ranir. Good evening, colleagues. I'd like to welcome each and every one of you um, to this important webinar today. March 24th is the World Tuberculosis Day, a clinical problem that is still very much with us. And as practicing clinicians, would be very much aware of the prevalence of the condition and uh, the difficulties that it caused for many of our people in the country. This is further complicated by the interaction between tuberculosis and um, the HIV epidemic that we're currently dealing with. To recognize this day and to remind ourselves um, of this ongoing problem, particularly in the light of the impact of COVID-19 with colleagues, um, you know, who are dealing with patients having chronic conditions, not being able, you know, to see their patients as readily as possible. This has resulted in a number of reverses, you know, that we have experienced in the past. We are therefore grateful today to have uh, Prof. Ruben with us, who will take us through some of the antibiotics and why they work in this particular context and why they don't work. Before we do that though, I'd like to welcome our esteemed chairperson of the SA Medical Association, Dr. Mvuyisi Mzokwa, to give us some opening remarks and welcome us all to this important webinar. Dr. Mzokwa. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ntlapo, the CEO of the South African Medical Association. Uh, and good evening to all the colleagues uh, who are here present. Um, uh, thank you for taking your time uh, from your busy schedules to join the South African Medical Association for a special tuberculosis webinar. Uh, as TB Awareness Month is, is nearing its end, uh, the latest global uh, uh, statistics, TB statistics, so to say, that uh, estimates uh, 10 million uh, people fell with TB in 2020 already, of which 1.3 uh, million died, including over 200,000 people living with HIV. The fact that TB is leading cause of death among uh, uh, people with HIV accounting for one of the three AIDS-related deaths is quite sobering. On the local front here in South Africa, uh, South Africa is, is one of the uh, highest TB patterns in the world, um, which is largely attributed to the country having one of the highest rates of TB HIV co-infection uh, with uh, approximately 60% of people with TB also living with HIV. The high burden of TB in South Africa is attributed to several factors, including the emergence of drug resistant TB strains uh, that has made TB treatment challenging and expensive, as you know. The COVID-19 uh, lockdown has created another challenge in the treatment of chronic disease throughout the country. And all efforts are now being made uh, to get back to the treatment campaign uh, for TB and HIV. 
with treatment in mind, allow me now uh, to take this opportunity, uh, this great honor to introduce the accomplished speaker of this evening, uh, Professor Eric Rubin, a professor of medicine at the Harvard uh, Medical uh, School and adjunct professor of immunology and infectious diseases at the Harvard T.H. Uh, Chan School of Public Health. Professor Rubin is a renowned physician scientist and also the editor-in-chief of the New England uh, Journal of Medicine. He holds an A.B. degree from Harvard College and MD and PhD degrees from Tufts University. He was a resident and a clinical fellow of the Massachusetts uh, General Hospital and a, a postdoctoral fellow at the Harvard Medical School. He, his research focuses on molecular biology and pathogenesis of mycobacterium uh, tuberculosis as has made significant contributions uh, to the medical fraternity uh, in understanding uh, of how the bacterium interacts with its host and how it evades the immune system. His work has led to the development of TB drugs and vaccines, as well as new diagnostic uh, tests. A fellow of the, Af African, uh, of the American, I'm sorry, American Academy of uh, Microbiology and a member of the National Academy of Medicine, Professor Rubin has received numerous awards and honors for his contributions to the field of TB research, including the Oswald Avery Award uh, from the Infectious Diseases Society of America and the uh, Coach Weeks Memorial uh, Medal uh, from the British Society for Antimicrobial Microbial, uh, Chemotherapy. He's a member of the National Academy of Medicine and the American Academy of Microbiology. In addition to his research, Professor Rubin is an infectious disease physician at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. He is a highly respected educator and a mentor who has trained numerous students and postdoctoral fellows, many of whom have gone on to a successful careers in academia and industry. He has also served as an advisor to government agencies, non-governmental organizations, and pharmaceutical companies on, meta, uh, related, on matters related to TB and infectious diseases. It's my honor and privilege now to uh, hand over to Professor uh, Rubin. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Um, Prof, you're still muted on your side. Better? That working yes, now? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we we can can hear you Prof. And you can see my slides? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, thank you so much for the very, very kind introduction. And um, I'm going to respond very ungraciously and say and, and apologize in advance for a couple of things. First off, um, I'm giving a slightly different talk and I'm gonna start out talking a little bit about TB, but move on to the how we learn more, um, which is really through research and the publication process. So I'm gonna talk more generally about publishing and, um, and, um, and, and understanding how the process works. Um, and, and, you know, my real, um, apology is for not being in South Africa to give the talk, uh, a place that I love. Um, and, and, and after all this discussion about me as a, as a, um, as an expert, the truth is that almost all of you are much more expert than I am, um, in treating TB. Um, and of course, as the numbers, uh, we heard suggest that, uh, TB is, the most common cause of death in um, in South Africa. It's very it's whereas I, as the local TB expert, see maybe ten cases a year. There are many people in South Africa who they see that that many or more cases in a single week. 
Um, and of course, the solution to that is multifocal. One, of course, is identifying um, TB and trying to find people who have it um, uh, by, um, uh, by teaching people about the symptoms, by decreasing the amount of stigma and reporting it. And the, of course, the, um, the, the problems uh, that we just heard about with COVID-19, which has made the, the um, recruitment of patients so much more complicated um, and, um, and probably ultimately increased the rates of transmission of disease because infected patients remained in the community for longer. I just love this poster, by the way, from uh, the, the Department of Health, uh, with, um, which actually shows pretty graphically hemoptysis. Of course, we're not doing that well with uh, TB treatment. And if you compare it with other infections, it's really remarkable how difficult it is, has, it has been to treat. Um, this is a patient with MDRTB showing daily med burden um, in one of the older regimens. And it's, it's obviously uh, crazy, but even for drug sensitive disease, it takes a really long time to treat. And you're all familiar with the standard regimen, uh, which is a six week, six month regimen and requires multiple pills every day. Um, and, and it's not so clear why it should take so long, uh, why it should take so long. We do know something about the biology, various factors that might contribute. Some of these are, are the bacterial uh, are, are what we hypothesize about the bacteria anyway, which is that in the host, they might adopt an altered metabolic state. And that altered metabolism could lead to uh, various phenomena uh, like tolerance, like persistence, like dormancy, um, and that might contribute to the inability for antibiotics to work really well in vivo, even if they work well in vitro. Um, and one thing that is largely overlooked and I think might be very important for TB and other infections is that while we tend to look at sensitivity or resistance, we don't really look at how rapidly drugs work. And one might imagine that a drug that worked more rapidly might clear infection uh, uh, faster. Uh, but of course there are host factors which are um, uh, important as well. Um, there's the idea of Induced tolerance that changes in drug metabolism might, uh, by the host, might make a difference, and that bacteria might reside in host compartments where the drugs have a difficulty penetrating. For example, in uh, the uh, um, in the necrotic material within a granuloma, uh, where drug concentrations for many drugs are quite low. It, of course, the thing is that TB is not as unique as we sometimes think of it, think it is, and that perfectly common infections can be difficult to treat and can take a really extended uh, period of time to treat in some circumstances. Uh, for example, um, um, the um, uh, um, in, infections with some bacteria that are closely related to bacteria, somewhat related to bacteria, uh, like actinomyces can take a very long time to treat. And in fact, six months is a relatively short time for some of these infections, for some of them require more than a year of treatment. So one might say that these bacteria have characteristics that are similar to mycobacteria, and maybe that's why it takes so long, but it's harder to make that argument when it comes to common bacteria like staph and like strep, uh, when they get into certain compartments, for example, onto heart valves causing endocarditis. The treatment for those is also very, very extended. Um, and um, um, so that can, um, and, and, and so there's something about the host compartment that really matters. This is similarly true for osteomyelitis and in, in the bone, it's likely that antibiotics don't penetrate well, but it's also likely that the biofilms, which uh, bacteria form are very important in resisting killing by, by antibiotics. So what do we do about it? The truth is there are a lot of hypotheses. There are a lot of new drugs. How can we figure out how to utilize these better? And that brings me to the topic I'm going to discuss today, which has nothing to do with TB, which is that when we want to fix a medical problem, the way we get at them is by doing more research. And in TB, um, there is an enormous amount of research going on. 
Uh, great. Um, for, fortunately for us, there remains a lot of attention within uh, the pharmaceutical industry, even though there's very little uh, uh, motivation on price. Um, because there's uh, the drugs are never going to make a make 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 a lot of money, and if they make money at all, however, there is a lot of motivation um, among companies to get something done for prestige reasons, perhaps uh, because it's interesting to their own employees. But whatever for whatever reason, there are many new drugs in the pipeline, and I think that the prospects are good. Treatment of TB is already changing. We've had some recent clinical trials that have been very impressive. Um, I apologize for the grandfather clock in my back in the in the background, which will occasionally go off during the talk. Um, um, but um, there's a uh, uh, so so the prospects I think are very good. But it really gets us to the question of um, how we know this stuff, and the reason we know it is because this information gets published. So I want to spend some time talking about why we publish and how the publication works, um, and and it's been interesting to have the perspective of a journal editor. So why would you want to publish your work, your research, your clinical cases, your clinical experiences um, uh, anywhere at all? Well, one reason is you need to, in order to, for example, keep your job as an academic. Um, I bring up the, the example of this one guy who was a, uh, a, a chemical engineer, uh, Yuri Struchkov, um, who had a prodigious um, publication record. Um, he published a thousand papers um, in, in, over the course of less than a decade. So that meant he was publishing a paper less than every four days. Um, not many of us can keep up with Yuri, um, but um, it was a, uh, it, it's, it's quite amazing to think that he must've spent all of his time writing or making other people write more likely uh, to get this kind of output. Um, when you want to change jobs, if, for example, you're a trainee, then publishing can be very important within an, within academic circles. Um, and sometimes that leads to uh, people cutting corners uh, or frankly, making up data. Um, this is an example of the latter of making up data. Uh, unfortunately, it comes from our journal many years ago. This is the work of a, cardi of a cardiologist who was studying a, a genetic component of heart disease. Um, and this is the pedigree of the family that he published from uh, uh, that that had uh, uh, um, these characteristics. And if you look carefully, which the reviewers of this paper apparently didn't, um, you notice some unusual things. For example, this mother uh, had a uh, daughter when she was 52 years old. That happens, but it certainly is unusual. What's more unusual is that this this uh, this boy fathered a, a daughter when he was nine years old, which probably doesn't happen. And in fact, this whole pedigree didn't exist and it was all made up. And of course, you want to get paid to do your job. Here's an example from the, uh, the US NIH, uh, an interesting study which looked at the citation impact of each uh, uh, of, of individual papers and the amount of funding that went to the uh, researchers who were supporting that study. And you'll see that whether the study is a human study or a non-human study, um, there's a decent correlation between uh, the amount of money that you get and the, um, and, and the quality or, uh, or the impact of a publication. Quality and impact, of course, are not the same thing, uh, but um, just as a crude measure of quality. And of course, the other reason is that you want to publish is you want to because you have an idea about how, how to think about a scientific or a medical problem. You have a better way to treat patients, you think, and you want other people to discuss your ideas and put them into practice. So publishing, I think, is an extremely important part of the research process, part of the clinical care process as well as we try to improve our care of patients. So when do you publish? Um, one time is that you can publish is when you are changing jobs and you have to kind of get the data all together and rush it out there. That can be a very difficult time to publish because you are only have access to the data for a certain amount of time. Um, you have taken on new responsibilities. So it's a, it's a tough time to publish. It's much better when you think you have a good story to tell um, and um, you are, you've come to the, some sort of conclusion about your story. 
it's important to remember that it takes an incredibly long time, though, much longer than you um, expect. How do you choose a place to publish? Well, of course, there are very practical considerations. What are the chances of getting in? Everyone would like to publish in um, nature or science or uh, the Lancet, um, but not every study is appropriate for those sorts of uh, journals. So um, it's worth thinking about whether or not there's any chance at all of, 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 of your manuscript getting accepted. There's also a place. Uh, will the right people see, that, see it if you publish in this particular journal? Are the readers of this journal the people who are your target audience? Um, and what are the chances that someone will believe your story or will adopt your, um, your recommendations? To some extent, that depends on the journal, whether or not, of course, they read it and the influence that that has, um, that, that if, and it has in general as a reputation. So how do you figure out how good your work is? Um, well, there's, there's a broadness question. Um, is, this a bro is this broadly applicable? Is this something that would be of interest to people outside of your field? Um, or something that's very important, even if it is restricted to your field? The are the results positive or negative? Interestingly, that can, uh, that, that is not a simple answer um, when it comes to publication. Um, in our journal, in the Journal of Medicine, we publish many negative studies. Um, the question certainly has to be important, though, before we publish a negative study. We publish negative studies when, for example, they contradict uh, some, something that everyone believes, or it's a study that everyone's been waiting for, and it's going to be interesting, whatever the, the conclusions are. And, and, and finally, it's important to consider how convincing the data are. Are the conclusions secure? So should you go for a general or a specialized journal? Um, these are both generalized journals, but um, the, uh, the influence and the prestige associated with them are very different between Nature and PLOS One. Um, both are good journals, um, but they both, but getting into Nature is admittedly far more difficult than PLOS One. Even, in, that's equally true in medical journals. Um, there's a journal like ours, uh, which is very influential. And the Medical Journal of Australia, which publishes an article on jellyfish stings, is a very important um, uh, medical issue in Australia where there's a great deal of, um, uh, of diving on reefs. Not so not important enough, though, that we would likely publish it because it's not of general enough interest. There are specialized science journals like uh, Nature Biotechnology, which is a very high impact factor journal. And, and I will mention impact factor occasionally along the way, but I don't want to speak too much about it. Impact factor is a measure, an imperfect measure of a journal. Nevertheless, Nature Biotechnology is a very widely read journal as compared to the other journal here, the Jordanian Journal of Computers and Information Technology. Um, and uh, there are, uh, and, and that's true in medicine as well. CA is um, a journal that publishes all reviews. And because of the way that impact factors are calculated, this is the highest impact factor in all of medicine, or at least it was until um, COVID came around. Uh, whereas um, this BMC ENT journal um, is, is a much lower impact factor, um, but might publish work that's very important if you're an otolaryngologist. So how do you decide which journals to go to? Here are two titles of real studies. Uh, the first one is a very detailed um, description of a study. And the second one so sounds like it's describing something that's much more general. Um, uh, the, uh, how, how important is the antiretroviral therapy uh, as opposed to a single study. The first one, the study got published in PLOS One. The more general title ended up in the New England Journal. Um, <clears throat> another pair though, uh, where uh, we have a slightly different outcome is a, an actual study of a therapeutic vaccine for uh, preventing HIV or, or HIV-like disease, SIV in uh, monkeys and a review study, a review looking at non-human primate models uh, like the one used in this study. And here we get kind of the opposite uh, 
the uh, the scientific study got published in Nature, um, and the review got published in POS Pathogens, a very good journal, but um, not not Nature. I think that there's a um, there's a journal for everybody. There's a journal for any sort of study um, on anything, um, including um, how good do tadpoles taste. Um, uh, a, a a journal that you know a, a, an issue about toilets that might be only of ish, of interest to Scots, which is why it ended up in the Scottish Medical Journal. Um, uh, whether or not uh, what how do ostriches behave toward humans and do they court humans? Um, chickens like more beautiful humans um, and. Uh, a study of looking at how much force is required to drag sheep over various surfaces, which might have ended up in an Australian journal as well, but did not. Um, and whether or not red-footed tortoises have contagious yawning. Um, so there's a home for all of these uh, for all of these studies, and um, there's a home for anything that we do as well. <laughs> um, so when you're thinking about it, what do you consider? has the journal published in this area? Um, and one measure of that is, are you citing, when you're writing your article, are you citing articles from that journal? Because that would suggest that it might be a good target for you. And then there are more practical questions. Does, this rep does the journal have a bad reputation? Is it slow? Um, does it have a reputation of not being consistent um, uh, with, uh, with reviews? Um, are, is the editor someone you respect or uh, the editor who would handle your manuscript to be someone you respect or is it someone who um, whose um, own science you hold in low regard? So lots of things go into it. And how do you learn about these? Um, there are various ways. Um, there are various sources. I would argue that your mentors and your peers uh, might be the best source because a lot of, the, of what you learn about journals is anecdotal. So when you're preparing your manuscript, what do you, how do you do it? First, you make sure that you're getting into the right sort of format for both for that journal and for the sort of research you're doing. For example, in clinical trials, uh, uh, sorry, first on the left, in microbiology or bacterial genetic studies, there are standard ways of expressing uh, the, um, uh, the work that you're doing. There's a, there's a, table of all the plasmids and DNA constructs, um, usually as table one um, or the first supplementary table in every study. Um, and if you're going to go to a microbiology study uh, journal, you should expect to enter material like that. Um, in a clinical trial, uh, there's usually a concert diagram. There's usually a table one, which talks about the demographic characteristics of the patients. If you don't fit that either. You might want to think about how you're writing, um, because the for a journal to be an appropriate audience, or you might want to think about um, whether or not you're go you're going to the right journal if everyone else has a concert diagram. So the first thing, of course, is considering the format, and then if English, if you're not comfortable with your English, it's important to get help. Um, there are very ways ways to do that. There are ways that are not so good. Um, Google Translate is not particularly good at science. In fact, it's not always so good at lots of other things. This is an old slide, but uh, but true, uh, with uh, Miley Cyrus singing, I'm in love with your body, and Google Translate translating that to, I like that cadaver. Um, it's gotten better, um, I should say. Uh, and there are better tools now, which is, um, using AI tools like ChatGPT, which is probably a very much better translator uh, than Google Translate was. Uh, but it, you have to be very careful about using tools like AI um, because different journals now have different rules about how to use it. And in fact, I had a meeting this morning of the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors to try to hammer out what was going to be acceptable for the use of AI in, in, in authorship um, and happy to talk about that. And then finally, follow the rules. Um, it, it's um, last week. So our journal for research reports has a or what we call original articles has a word limit of twenty seven hundred words. We get articles all the time that are trying to that are a, a little over that limit, and for the most part, we let them go until we, we get to the point of of accepting them. Um, but last week, I got a manuscript that was ten thousand words. 
And we're not even going to consider a manuscript like that. So it's really important. If you don't want to make, don't make the editor angry, try to do what they, what they do. Finally, and this is the most, often the most difficult part, which is to try to tell a story. Um, it doesn't matter how you did the work. It doesn't matter what order it happened in. It's really important though, to tell a story that makes sense to a reader. And that might mean reordering the way that you did things, changing your thinking. Even if you were thinking one thing when you started, now you're thinking something different. Organize the facts that uh, in a way that helps communicate that to a reader. Um, and, and that generally means that most of the data you've collected and most of the analyses you've done will, will not end up in the, in the final paper. A lot of it ends up on the cutting room floor and it's important for your understanding, but it's, it only confuses a reader. So what are the steps you wanna take before submission? Well, you wanna edit and after you've edited, you wanna edit again and edit again. And, and, and that often means a back and forth with, um, the, uh, with the other authors. Um, which who can be a very valuable source of trying to figure out whether or not you've, you're, you're doing it right. And then finally, write a cover letter. And the key part of a cover letter is to point out to an editor very briefly what's special about this, what is unique about it, because the editor may not read the entire manuscript. They're unlikely to before they make the decision as to whether or not to send a manuscript for review. So here's your chance to do a little bit of salesmanship without going overboard. Most journals will allow you to either cho choose author, uh, reviewers you prefer or exclude reviewers that you don't prefer. Um, I would be very careful about the latter. In general, if an author says, I want to exclude the 12, these 12 people who are experts on the topic, um, that suggests that there's something wrong. There's either something wrong with the field or something wrong with the manuscript or something wrong with the author. And it's not a good foot to start off with. So in my own work, I generally try not to exclude reviewers, even though I'm concerned. The other thing is that people tend to guess wrong. Um, when people have come up with um, concerns um, about reviews and said, I know that this was Dr. X who reviewed it, they're almost always wrong. And in fact, oftentimes when we sometimes send journals to the reviewers that uh, authors didn't want us to send them to because they are the experts, we get very positive reviews. So it's not so simple. What kind of re reviews? So you sent it in and it went for review and the reviews came back and the editor sends you a letter. What do those letters say? There's uh, There are letters that can say you only have to make minor changes. That's great. Um, that means you're in. When you get the major revision letter though, it has comes both by different names, but it's major, generally considered to be major revisions are required. That means you're not in. That means you have to go back, be re-reviewed. And, um, um, and that means it's really very important to respond to the reviewers, to be very responsive because they're likely to see it again. And certainly responsive to the editors. It is permissible to disagree with some of the points but the more you disagree, the less likely you are to get accepted. You can be rejected, but there's the chance to resubmit if you do a lot of work. And that's a more negative review, but at least it allows you to go back in. Or you can be rejected with extreme prejudice and never be able to submit that to that journal again. I think what's important here is that reviewers are offering you advice. Um, you can choose not to take that advice, but you're taking it, but you choose make that choice at your peril. Um, they have thought about it and they're probably something valuable there. So even if you don't go back to the same journal, I would always make edits in response to the reviewers at the journal that rejected you. Um, nowadays, it's very common for journals to live in journal families and for their to refer you to another journal in that same journal family, generally one with a with a with less a lesser reputation or a lower impact factor, um, I think it's difficult. It's a difficult decision. Oftentimes, do I want to go to another journal that I think is better, or do I want to go to uh, take the easy route and just let the uh, manuscript and the reviews transfer to this other journal? One important thing to remember is there's generally the opportunity if you uh, intervene to make 
to make edits in response to the original reviews before that transfer occurs. And you should take advantage of that if it's true. So you can do rewriting and submitting it. You can do put additional data in or do additional experiments, rewrite and submit it. You can appeal to the editors and some people do this routinely. In general, it's not the most successful strategy um, for a rejected manuscript and you're almost better off submitting somewhere else or transferring to another uh, transferring to another journal. There are many kinds of journals. Most of these uh, aspects don't matter all that much um, to you as an author, um, but it can change your experience. Um, academic societies versus profit-making publishers, academic societies tend to, tend to have uh, uh, higher quality journals with some notable exceptions. Um, journals can be open access or subscription only, and it's important that many um, funders now require you to publish in open access journals. Nowadays, almost any journal will permit you to publish open access if that's required by your funder, even if it's a subscription-based uh, journal. Um, and finally, academic editors are smart people in, from your field who know something. Professional editors generally are able to take more, a lot more time, though, um, on your manuscript. So um, I think there are advantages to, to each. Let me talk about what happens when a paper comes in, and I'm going to use our journal as, as um, an illustration. I've been an editor at several academic journals. Um, this is the first medical journal, um, and so it's it, but it's what I know, so it's what I'm going to talk about. We are very driven by our mission statement, uh, which is that we want to publish work that is going to affect medical practice um, either tomorrow, in, in, in many cases tomorrow, or in some cases, five years from now, uh, as we like to publish breakthroughs that have not yet been implemented in clinical work. Um, we're very aware of that. We discuss that with every manuscript we discuss. Uh, we discuss what potential impact that's going to have on the field. I'm using the year 2015 um, as an example here. And the reason I am is that everything was twisted by COVID where we had 30,000 uh, we're, we're sorry, more than 20,000 COVID-related submissions um, in 2020, for example, far more than we get in, under, in a normal year under any circumstances. So, um, so let me go back to 2015 and give you an idea of what we got. We got about 15,000 manuscripts uh, submitted, um, about a third of those are original research, um, and, a, and another quarter are letters. And a lot of the letters also represent original research. Um, and you can see the breakdown of uh, the rest of it. Um, how do things work? Uh, and a manuscript is submitted, it comes to me, and I'm the first point of review. I'll read everything that, every all the research that gets submitted and, and decide whether or not it gets asso uh, assigned to either an associate or a deputy editor um, who do further handling, or it gets rejected at that point in 1984. In, 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 um, in, sorry, in 2015, about 20% of papers were rejected at that point. When it gets to the, spe the specialist editor, um, those people represent uh, a, a wide variety of um, expertise. Uh, their associate editors, um, I think there are probably there are 10 or 11 associate editors now covering various uh, fields. Um, and they're almost all local, although we have some that are uh, that join us remotely now. Um, and uh, they they know a lot about a topic. The deputy editors similarly are 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 experts in in um, in areas. Between the associate and deputy editors, about half of manuscripts get rejected without further review. And altogether about 15% of manuscripts get sent out for peer review. Once it once something is peer reviewed, um, back in the days before COVID, it would come back, and if the editor thought that the reviews were sufficiently encouraging that it was something that they wanted to discuss, they'd bring it to the editor's meeting. We still have an editor's meeting, although it's a hybrid meeting now, and so there aren't 30 people crammed into a room like uh, there used to be. And each manuscript gets presented by the handling editor um, going carefully through, every, through the entire article, uh, the, the entire manuscript. Uh, why was this work done? Uh, what's the setting for it? Are people asking this question? And then go through every figure um, to go through all the data and then go through the reviews. And at this editorial 
Uh, and then we have an extensive discussion about any aspect of the work, the science, the, um, the ethics involved, the statistical analyses involved. Um, there are five statistical editors here in the room with us um, and, um, and, and make a decision as to whether or not we're going to proceed. Um, maybe half of the manuscripts that we discuss at that meeting uh, will go on for uh, further review and most of them um, the, and, and go for further in-depth statistical review. And in the end, about 5% of research manuscripts get uh, were uh, accepted in 2015. That number is lower now. Um, there are uh, rejections without discussions. There are, are rejections after peer review. There are the very rare papers where we ask for more material. Um, and then most, almost all of our letters are major revision letters, um, which end up being about 5% of, of the research articles that we look at. Um, why do we reject things? Um, the quality isn't good. Um, it's not new. Um, it's too specialized for us. We're a general medical journal. Um, but in the end, we reject many very good papers because we only publish about 200 uh, original research articles a year. Um, and you can see the breakdown here. Uh, we publish a lot more. Uh, um, we publish more letters than original research articles just because they're short. Many of those are referring to work that we've already published, but about you know, on the order of one or possibly two letters a week are their own stories, um, short stories. Um, um, in addition, we publish reviews. Uh, these are almost all solicited reviews. Um, images, uh, we publish a couple of those a week and various commentaries and perspectives. Some of those, the editorials um, are solicited, the perspectives generally, most of them are not. Um, and uh, the, our bread and butter is uh, interventional trials. Uh, for the most part, we're publishing randomized controlled trials. They can be large or small, but those make up the majority of what we publish. We do publish some epidemiology, but I suspect that sector of the pie has gotten smaller um, and some basic biology or, or experimental medicine um, and very few case reports. Um, that's what I wanted to tell you about today. And I'm sorry I got uh, sidetracked from, um, from TB, um, but I'm happy to uh, talk about TB or anything else that I discussed already. Um, and I don't know, how do you want to handle, handle questions? Should I take the questions from the... Sure. Um, Prof? Uh, let me thank you so much uh, you know, for the presentation. Um, I know that uh, some of our colleagues would have been looking so much for the discussion on tuberculosis, but certainly you can take questions on that as well. But I think then, you know, the discussion around uh, publication would be, you know, of equal importance and interest as we try and, um, you know, collate the information that we gather in our daily clinical work. So I've got two questions as a starting point there, Prof, that have been raised in the Q&A and would encourage colleagues to send their questions to the Q&A. I'll give them both to you at the same time and, um, you know, take your responses to that and see sure. if you've got any other further questions, you know, after, you know, those have been answered. The first question comes from Dr. Ngube and um, is asking how and where could doctors publish case reports, especially in cases where the doctors have got no funding for the publication cost? Uh, that is the first question. Um, the second question, I think probably uh, of interest um, you know, to you as well as an editor of a highly prestigious journal, uh, Dr. Mutau is wondering what is the implication if your article is discussed in the editor's commentary section of a journal? And uh, some of the things that probably would go to mind, does it reflect the quality of the article or is it just a way for the editor to stimulate interest of the readers? Those are the first two uh, questions there, Prof. Um, thanks, and, and both really great questions. Before I answer either of them, let me um, just say that um, we publish a, in the New England Journal, we publish a disproportionate number of articles from South Africa. Um, the impact of South African research um, really hugely exceeds the size of the country. Um, and I, I think I just want to give a shout out to uh, many of the people here who have done such 
incredible research, particularly in the areas of TB and HIV, um, that have really changed our thinking as a world about these diseases. Um, so um, it's been a, a, a tremendous pleasure to be involved um, and to uh, see some people I know, like for example, McClenge, who asked, asked the first question, hello McClenge. So let me, let me start with yours. Um, can, where do we publish case reports? So um, case reports are, um, are interesting. Um, we publish a very small handful of them. And generally those are restricted to cases that illustrate new biology or are the sort of leading in the, in the case of infectious disease, the very first case of something that is a, is a, is a real problem. Um, let me give you a, an example. Um, in the area of TB, uh, I'm, I'm not even sure we published this, but something that we would have published is there was a um, an outbreak of TB um, in the U.S. that was caused by bone grafts. Um, so a, a the donor of this bone graft material uh, was in uh, which uh, uh, was a cadaver in in Mexico turned out to have uh, POTS disease, which was had not been picked up, and the bone grafts, which were were live cells. Um, for this kind of procedure that they were doing, were trans, were uh, were um, introduced at surgery into a large number of patients, all of whom developed TB. Um, so, when the first cases came out and it was first identified as being transmitted this way, that is something we published. Um, we also published um, uh, an outbreak of Burkholderia, not the outbreak, but actually the first case of Burkholderia when it was uh, figured out that it was due to a um, an imported um, uh, a, um, a, um, material that was being used um, for to to improve the scent, the smell in in in, in places, um, and that that was being sold, and it was contaminated with Burkholderia. Um, so, um, so we do publish case reports. Mostly, though, we don't. We don't publish. We get a lot of submissions. Um, here's in a very unusual case of X. We don't usually publish unusual cases of X unless there's a strong teaching point to make, uh, a, a strong and new novel uh, teaching point to make. So where can you publish these things? Um, there are a couple of options. Um, specialty journals do, pub many specialty journals do publish um, uh, case reports. Um, and in fact, in, in infectious disease, for example, there's a case report journal, which is really quite legitimate. Um, the problem that you bring up is funding. Um, who's going to pay for publishing this if there's no support for the underlying research? Um, and, and that gets to the difference between subscription journals and um, that it, journals that are supported by subscription and those that are, uh, that are open access. Open access journals always will charge authors. Um, although some of them will have a scholarship system where um, a, if you can't pay, they will you can apply for uh, for for support for your study. Um, whereas subscription journals like ours, you never pay. Uh, the author never pays. No one. Um, so um, so I, I think you have to shop around a little bit um, uh, uh, for for case reports, and you have to think hard about how important is this case. Or can I turn this into a case series, which is something that will be more attractive to any journal than a single case report, uh, a single anecdote? Um, Dr. Mato asks uh, about the um, uh, about when do we commission? If I have this right, when do we commission editorials um, about uh, our publications? And there's no hard and fast rule about this, but uh, and and I should say we're publishing more editorials now, a greater percentage of the articles that we publish now have accompanying editorials. In general, the point of an editorial is to try to translate for a clinician what, what the article means for their practice. Um, and, and so we use them in, I think, three general cases. One is this is really important, and people should not be doing what they were should what they were doing before. They really should change change what they're doing based on the results of this study. So that would prompt us to publish an editorial. The second one is, you know, it's difficult to understand this study because it contradicts a, uh, something else that's been published, or 
um, it's, not, it's, a, it's slightly shakier than one would hope, even though it's an important question. Then we want an editorialist to in, help a clinician interpret those results. Is this right for your patient? Is this something that you should be doing? Or do the drawbacks um, and the flaws in the study, and of course, all studies have flaws, mean that for your specific patient or for your scenario, this isn't the right thing to do. Recently, we've added a third category of uh, editorial. These are called, we call them the science behind the study. And these really are trying to explain um, some aspect of the basic science that went into the study that we published. Um, they're published, by, they're written by an expert on the topic and they're aimed at clinicians. Um, I, I'm not sure how successfully and I welcome any feedback, uh, but the idea is to tell you why was this cool? Why is it interesting? And what's it? What's the science mean um, ultimately to what's going to happen in patients? We often publish those with uh, smaller um, early phase studies, although we've published them for phase three uh, randomized controlled trials as well. Um, and, and do I have words of wisdom for diagnosing uh, TB in children? I, I think that this is a really moving area and a extraordinarily difficult. So you all have experienced uh, the, the difficulty with uh, children who won't produce sputum um, um, or children who are uh, much more susceptible to extrapulmonary TB than, than adults are. And extrapulmonary TB, whether in a child or an adult, is very difficult to diagnose. Um, there's no, and, and um, there are um, gastric aspiration tests and all sorts of things that are not all that that are very invasive and not all that um, uh, sensitive for, for disease. Um, so right now there isn't a simple answer. I do think that there are some things on the horizon for children that will make a difference. Um, and let me just, they fall into a few categories. Let me, let me um, talk about at least a few of them. One is um, the blood signature of infection. That's been around for a while, a study from, um, uh, that was performed in Ghana, if I, oh no, in, sorry, in, um, in, in, in the Gambia um, several years ago, suggested that if you look at RNA expression in white blood cells, rather complicated test, that there was a signature of TB infection um, in children. Um, that's been followed up on in a number of different studies, whether in adults or in children. It hasn't been reduced to practice, and I'm not sure it's going to be. But if it were, it would be a strong. In, it might be a strong indicator, at least in a child with a normal immune system, so that they have a normal uh, set of uh, host responses. Um, it might be a, a good way of diagnosing disease. The second way is through antigen tests, um, and um, uh, many of you are familiar with the LAM test, uh, which is uh, the uh, which tests for a component of the uh, bacterial cell wall, usually in urine, so the urine lamb test, using a dipstick test. That test has been, I think, moderately useful in, in HIV, in particular in people with a very advanced HIV, and much less useful in people um, with uh, normal immunity. Um, and, and that's probably a function of how much antigen there is. Well, the test is actually very insensitive. And if we had a better test for antigen, it may be that this would be the way to make the to make all all diagnoses, um, um, whether in children or adults. And I'm encouraged there because it's clear that if you use advanced methods like mass spectrometry, very highly sensitive mass spectrometry, um, you can detect this these uh, the uh, this, these molecules. And I know there's already a second generation LAM test, and there are probably going to be more coming out there. So that is the, the second way. And third, there are some very innovative ways of looking at, um, uh, at, at diagnostics that are probably a few years away from us, um, but I'm hoping that they will make a big impact um, because uh, of all the patients that we care for, children have been the, more, the most difficult group. And I'm running out of questions. I think you've covered all the questions at the moment there, Prof. Um, it might uh, probably be the good way you know, to end the conversation uh, for
for tonight. Uh, what then remains, I think, for us is to thank you for having taken the time. I know it's very early on your side uh, to be with our colleagues here in South Africa. Um, we continue to, as you indicated in the earlier slides, um, battle with tuberculosis and some of the you know, ramifications that I think clinically would um, you know, confront us as clinicians in the country. Um, I wanted to, okay, no, no, it's fine. I wanted to check the fourth um, question to see if it is, um, you know, related to a clinical question. And again, I think, um, you know, thank you so much once again, you know, as the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, probably some, you know, significant insights that would have been taken from the presentation that you've given uh, for colleagues who may be interested in the publishing world, as it were. And I thought that was, you know, useful and uh, probably colleagues would be in a position to take that back and those that are you know thinking about publishing you know be in a position to be um interacting i think a lot more um intelligently with the area uh, of publishing as it were i think with that then prof um thanks once again um you know for having honored us with your time and sharing some of your insights with regard to tuberculosis and secondly you know the published world as it were. With that in mind, um, let me thank all colleagues that have been part of this conversation. We will be having a number of these webinars coming up. Please be on the lookout and um, we will you know, continue to communicate and look forward to having these engagements as we stay on top of the, you know, the world in terms of the new developments that will be taking place in clinical places, but also then you know, some of the issues that will be relating to the health policy in the country. With that, I'd like to thank uh, Prof once again and everybody that has been part of this conversation. Have a good night.